All right, so let's take a look at 1 Corinthians 15. We're going to start with verse 29, and we're going to get almost to the end of the chapter. So we're going to be reading a lot of Scripture. And uh, lest I be accused of cowardice, I'm actually going to tackle one of the most uh, mysterious and confounding verses in the whole Bible tonight. And you get to see how I do on that. Uh, but remember, 1 Corinthians 15 is all about the resurrection of the dead. Not just the resurrection of Jesus on Easter Sunday, but our resurrection and the idea that there's, a day, there's coming a day when we will have new bodies, when we will inhabit a, a physical re, a realm, a physical dimension. We're not, you know, the, the biblical view of heaven is not disembodied spirits floating around in the ether. It's certainly not us becoming angels. That's nowhere found in Scripture. We have new bodies. We live on a new earth. That is eternity that we're looking for. But what will it be like? This, this passage, more than any other single passage in the Bible, helps give us information about what our future looks like. So, starting with verse 29, remember, we're right in the middle of Paul's argument where he is, the reason he wrote, the whole, the whole reason he wrote the chapter was there were people in the church in Corinth, as if they didn't already have enough problems, there were people in the church in Corinth that were saying, oh, there's not really a resurrection of the dead. Now, whether they thought there wasn't an afterlife at all, or they thought we were just going to be disembodied spirits, I don't know. I suspect that they, that was the latter that they believed. But either way, Paul's point is, listen, there has to be a resurrection. Otherwise, Jesus wasn't raised, and if Christ isn't raised, then we're all dead. Then our faith is worthless, and we might as well just quit being Christians. So he picks up in verse 29. Otherwise, what do people mean by being baptized on behalf of the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, why are people baptized on their behalf? Why are we in danger every hour? Now, verse 29 is what I'm talking about when I say the most confounding verse in the Bible. May, I don't know if it's the single most confounding, but it's definitely in the top five. What on earth is Paul talking about when he says, why are people baptized for the dead? Okay, you ready? I don't know. <laughs> I don't, but uh, I, I can give you the, the, the theories, all right? And I can tell you what I think. The, what most people read when they see this is they think that perhaps there was some practice in Corinth. Remember, the Corinthians were, were former idolaters, former pagans, so they had some weird practices, I'm sure. That One of their practices was that if you had a loved one who died outside of Christ, you would go get baptized on their behalf in hopes that would help them in the afterlife. That's the theory, and that Paul is commenting and saying, if, if there's no resurrection, then those people are wasting their time. Now, I've got three problems with that theory. Number one, there's no record of that anywhere in history outside of the Mormon church, which didn't exist back then. Number two, that would clearly contradict Scripture. Paul himself would tell you, once a person's dead, there is nothing you can do for them, good or bad, re regarding their salvation. Uh, so, that, if that practice existed back then, it was clearly unbiblical. And number three, and this is the main thing for me, knowing what we know about Paul, knowing how exacting he was, how precise he was, it's hard to believe that Paul would mention an unbiblical practice in the church in Corinth and not say anything against it. You understand what I'm saying? If this practice actually existed and Paul was mentioning it, Knowing Paul, he would say, y'all know you shouldn't do that, right? Of course, he wouldn't say y'all. So I don't think that's the answer. Although if you do, I can't disprove you. So here's the other theory. Here's the best one I've read. I didn't come up with this on my own. This is the one I think is most likely, and that is that it was people who were saying, the whole reason I came to know Jesus is because my loved one was a Christian and she died or he died, and I want to see them again, and I know the only way I'm going to see them again is by coming to know Christ. So I am being baptized for someone who is dead. You see what I mean? I'm being baptized so I can see my saintly grandmother. I'm being baptized so I can see my dad. I'm being baptized so I can see my brother who passed away, and I know he was a believer, and I'm not, but I want to become one so I can see him again. That makes sense to me because it, it makes sense in the context of resurrection. What Paul's saying is, if your motivation for getting saved is you want to see your loved ones again, well, if there's no resurrection of the dead, then it's a waste of your time. You might as well not have gotten saved. 
That, I think, is what he's saying. Now, here's the main point I want to stress to you, and I hope, if you forget everything I just said, I hope you remember this. When it comes to these mysterious verses in the Bible, and there's enough of them that you could, you could fill a chapter of a book, I'd say. But when you come across those, and this is one of them, don't spend so much time worrying about and studying and tossing back and forth theories and agonizing over them that you miss the parts of the Bible that are obvious. Because 99.9% .9 of the Bible, the meaning is obvious. You know, I put it this way, uh, someone said to Mark Twain once, who was not a Christian, by the way, boy, the parts, there's certain parts of the Bible that really bother me because I don't know what they mean. And Twain said, well, you should be bothered by the parts that you do understand. And he's right. We should focus on the parts of the Bible we do understand because we've got plenty of work to do on those. Now, it's of interest to study these mysterious parts. It's interesting. It's, it's, there is mean, there's purpose to it. But don't get bogged down in the minutia. Don't get bogged down on how many angels can dance on the head of a pen. So to go on, verse 30, he says, So why are we in danger every hour? I protest, brothers, by my pride in you, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord. I die every day. What do I gain if, humanly speaking, I fought with beasts at Ephesus? If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. What is Paul saying? He's saying, if there's no resurrection, then I've wasted my life. I've put myself in a position where I'm persecuted, I'm hounded from city to city, and I'm doing this because I think there's going to be an afterlife. If there's no afterlife, then I should have just lived a much more relaxing and self-centered life. Now, when he says, I fought with wild beasts at Ephesus, I don't think he means literally. If you're picturing in your mind the old scenes of Christians being thrown to lions, there's no evidence that happened to Paul. And I don't even think that had started happening at this point in history yet. That was later on when the Romans started persecuting the church. Um, I think what he's referring to, though, is the, the riot that took place in Ephesus. We talked about it a, a earlier last year in the fall uh, when the, the pagans got angry because Paul's preaching was hurting the, their trade and selling little silver shrines of the goddess Artemis. And there was this huge riot, you may recall, where they, they all gathered in the local stadium and chanted for three hours, and Paul's own life was in danger. I think that's what he's saying is, why would I put myself in a position like that where I could have been torn from limb to limb? Why would I let myself be thrown in prison? All I'd have to do is say, okay, I'm done. I'm not preaching in this name anymore, and they'd set me free. Why do I go through all this trouble? Because I believe there's a life after this one. I believe that every second I spend or let's say every day I spend in misery for Christ is going to be replaced with an infinity of days in, re in rejoicing. It's going to be worth it. Verse 33, Do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. Wake up from your drunken stupor, as is right, and do not go on sinning. For some have no knowledge of God. I say this to your shame. And I think that's him saying, these people who keep trying to convince you there's no resurrection, just stop listening to them. And that's good advice. There are people, and Paul talks about this in, in his letters to Timothy, don't get caught up in, in foolish arguments and genealogies. I think that includes today the conspiracy theories you hear all the time and, and the wild speculation both in politics and in religion. He says, don't waste your time with that stuff. Focus instead on Christ. And if people want to go on with that stuff, then just don't hang around with them anymore. They're, they're dragging you down. They're pulling you away from what is true and what is wholesome and what is right. And what is right is the resurrection, the coming resurrection of the dead. So now we get to the, the long section. We're going to read from here all the way to the end of, almost the end of the chapter. So verse 35. But someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? You foolish person. Now that's a little bit of a surprise, isn't it? Because that seemed like normal questions. I want to know what my body's going to be like in the afterlife. Paul says, you foolish person. Well, don't feel insulted. He gives you an answer. What you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And what you sow is not the body that is to be, but a bare kernel, perhaps of wheat or of some other grain. But God gives it a body as he has chosen, and to each kind of seed its own body. 
For not all flesh is the same, but there is one kind for humans, another for animals, another for birds, and another for fish. There are heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly is of one kind, and the glory of the earthly is of another. There is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars, for star differs from star in glory. So, is, so it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable, what is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. If there's a natural body, there's also a spiritual body. Thus it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a, became a life-giving spirit. But it is not the spiritual that is first, but the natural, and then the spiritual. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are of the dust. And as is the man of heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Now we're not done, but we're going to stop there for right now. And we'll continue in just a minute. But I want you to see what Paul's just done there is he's given us a description of our future bodies using two metaphors and three adjectives. All right. So two metaphors. Number one, the metaphor of the plant. Most of you have, you're either gardeners now or maybe you grew up in a place where there was farming done. So you know what it means to plant a seed in the ground and then you come back later and it has grown. I know there's more to it than that. But that's Paul's analogy. He's saying, don't think, about, don't think in terms of your present body because the future body is going to be something greater. You plant the seed in a ground, you have to walk away from it. You can't just plant it in the ground and snap your fingers and then there's a plant. It takes time. What Paul's point is, is there has to be a death in order for there to be a resurrection. Now, the only exception to that, of course, is the people who are still alive when Christ returns. As he talks about in 1 Thessalonians, they'll be immediately with Jesus, and, and we all hope that's us. But in the meantime, we know that if we die, we shouldn't grieve about our own death because we know that we are immediately with Christ in spirit and our bodies will be raised on the last day. So his, his analogy of the plant and the seed tells us two things. He tells us, first of all, there's continuity with this present life. And what I mean by that is you're not a different person in heaven. You're the same person, just like the, the plant that comes out of the ground. If you plant peas, that was my grandpa's favorite crop. If you plant peas, peas are going to come out of the ground. You're not going to plant, it, plant a pea seed in the ground and then have corn or an oak tree. You're still going to be you in heaven. There's continuity, but there's also supremacy. Just like that pea plant is much better, it's bigger, it's, it's more fruitful than the pea seed, or you can use corn, or you can use pecan like I did on Sunday. So our future bodies are going to be so much more superior to our old bodies, there is no way we're ever going to look back and say, well, I missed the body I used to have. There's just no chance. So there's continuity and supremacy. And then the second metaphor is the body of Jesus. So that's in verse 49. He says, we will bear the image of the man of heaven. He's talking about Christ. By the way, that's a, that's a theme in Paul's writing is this idea that Adam came first and Adam brought death. How did Adam bring death? By committing a sin. When Adam and Eve sinned, that's when, that's when death entered our world. Jesus came and he was, in Paul's term, the last Adam. He was the one who fixed the problem that Adam caused. His death killed death for us. Adam's sin brought death to us. Jesus' death brought us life, you see. And so Jesus, the last Adam, it says we will bear his image. And there is other evidence that indicates the same thing, which is, and let me just read you another scripture that indicates this. Philippians 3.21. I meant to have that marked, but you're going to have to see how I do it, uh, Bible drill. Not so good so far. Can you lick your fingers during COVID? I don't know. Uh, Philippians 3, 21, it says, Our Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like His glorious body by the power that enables Him even to subject all things to Himself. 
So if we take that literally, and I do, that means that what we see in the body of Jesus after his resurrection gives us some clues as to what our resurrection bodies will be like. So what do we know about Jesus' resurrection body? Did Jesus still look like himself? Yeah, he did. There were times in his post-resurrection when people didn't recognize him, but it wasn't because he didn't look like himself. Because later on, when they got a good look at him, they were, oh, that's the Lord. Did Jesus eat food? Yeah. That's what he comes up to them on the beach in John 21 and says, I'm hungry. Do you have any fish? And they say, yes, there you go. Um, was he touchable? Could you touch him? Yes. He tells Thomas, touch my fingers or put your finger into my, into my hand and my feet. Put your hand into my side. He still bore his scars and that bothers some people. They say, well, does that mean we'll still bear scars in the next life too? I don't think so because of what we're about to read. But the fact that Jesus still had the scars on his hands and feet and in his side, maybe that's just a special dispensation. If you want to know my opinion, and that's all it is, is an opinion. I think Jesus' resurrected body still bears the scars because when we're with him in eternity, we'll want to see those and be reminded, that's why I'm here. That's why I'm saved. It'll be a, an eternal reminder of our salvation. And by the way, isn't it interesting that right now, Jesus is, as far as we know, the only person in heaven with a body. We don't know that people who die right now and, and go immediately be with Christ, we don't know if they have any embodied form or not. We'll have to figure out when we get there. We know that Jesus is in heaven in a body right now because he's never stopped. So those are the two metaphors. Now here's the three adjectives. Imperishable. He says, we have perishable bodies now. How many of us have said, well, I'm not as young as I used to be. You don't need to raise your hands. We've all said it. How many of us have seen a picture of ourselves 25 or 30 years ago and thought, oh, good grief, where did that person go? Yeah, that's, that's life. That's life in this world. How many of us have tried to do something that we used to be able to do really easily and suddenly found out to our disappointment we can't? How many of us have gone to the doctor, and I, I'm already starting to experience this, and there's a number on our physical that isn't good, and we say, what, what's going on there? I think I'm eating right, I'm exercising, and the doctor just says, well, this is part of getting older. Well, I didn't want to hear that. I, I did not want to hear that. In fact, I wanted to walk out when he said that, but it was true. That's, those are our bodies. Our present bodies are finite. They have expiration dates. I, I think about it this way. You give two different people a brand new Cadillac or Mercedes, or whatever your fa favorite fancy car is. And one of them leaves it outside, never washes it, never changes the oil, doesn't, doesn't, take, doesn't take care of it at all. The other person keeps it in the garage, keeps it waxed, changes the oil, maintains it, gets, gets tune-ups, I mean, just does everything, rotates the tires. That second guy's car is going to last longer. It's going to look better for longer, but you know what? It's still going to run out. Sooner or later, that car is going to die. And maybe it's a bad analogy because we're not machines, we're humans, but our bodies are going to wear out. And yes, yeah, some of us, if you take good care of the body God gave you, that's good stewardship. And I think God honors that, but it's still going to be finite. And I look at the person who's in spectacular shape and I, I think, well, that's good for you, but no matter how many push-ups you do or how, how many miles you run, someday... Your body's going to wear out anyway. I love this idea of an imperishable body. The, the idea that someday we'll have bodies that don't wear out, that don't have expiration dates. I love this quote from Joni Erickson Tata. Y'all, most of you are probably familiar with Joni. Uh, Johnny, Johnny Erickson Tata, uh, author who was paralyzed as a young woman in a diving accident. And she writes in a book that she wrote about heaven, and this is a quote, I can still hardly believe it. I, with shriveled bent fingers, atrophied muscles, gnarled knees, and no feeling from the shoulders down, will one day have a new body, light, bright, and clothed in righteousness, powerful and dazzling. Can you imagine the hope this gives to someone spinal cord injured like me, or someone who is cerebral palsied, brain injured, or who has multiple sclerosis? Imagine this, the hope this gives to someone who is bipolar. 
No other religion, no other philosophy promises new bodies, new hearts, and new minds. Only in the gospel of Christ do we find such incredible hope. And when I read that, I, I think of my mom, who's, who's in the process of Alzheimer's and still knows me. And so when I go visit her, we still can spend time together, but she's slipping away slowly. And that, that's very sad for me. And I look forward to the day when she's like she was before, and that's coming. Imperishable bodies. That's the future for us. And that's very good news. The second adjective he gives is powerful. These bodies are weak now, but they'll become powerful. How many of us have ever been frustrated at our inability to learn a new skill? Or to learn a new language? Or to do some physical act? Maybe when you were an athlete, you wanted to, you wanted to be the best at your sport, and you found out there were others who were bigger and stronger and faster and more coordinated, and that was frustrating. But our new bodies will be powerful. Now, how powerful? We don't know. We're not given specifics. Jesus seemed to have some abilities after he rose from the dead that he didn't before. I can't prove this, but I don't remember anything before the resurrection in which Jesus appeared and disappeared at will. And yet we see him just appearing in the upper room behind a locked door. And at the end, in Acts 1, he ascends into heaven. He never did that before that we know of. Does that mean that our new bodies will be able to teleport from place to place or that we'll be able to fly? Don't quote me on that because I don't know. What I do believe is that our bodies will be able to do anything that our redeemed hearts desire. Anything that God wills for us, we will be able to do. And that's good news because never again will we have to say, well, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak because we won't have weak flesh anymore. By the way, for those who are worried about, well, what are these new bodies going to look like? Well, we don't know my own theory because, as I said, Jesus looked like himself. I think we'll still look like ourselves in our new bodies. That's my theory. That's my opinion. If that disappoints you, and it probably does some of us, remember, we won't have the vanity we have now. We won't be worried about well, I wish I was taller, or I wish I was shorter, or I wish I was bigger or, or smaller. We, we won't think about those things. That won't matter anymore. Those shallow sentiments will be gone. And we'll look back and think, how silly were we that we worried about things like that? Whether my hair is curly or straight, or whether my teeth are white or not, we're going to be beautiful. We're going to be like a flower is more beautiful than its seed. We're going to glorify God. And that brings me to the last adjective, and that is the word spiritual. He says, it's born of physical body, it becomes a spiritual body. Look at verse 50 again. Verse 50 says, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. What is he saying? He's saying the fact that we'll have spiritual bodies doesn't make them any less physical. We won't be spirits or ghosts, but it means we'll have bodies that will have the ability to be in the presence of God. Right now, we can't. Right now, no one can see God and live. But our future bodies will be able to. Flesh and blood cannot inherit, but these new bodies will be able to because our sin will be gone, will be thoroughly redeemed. And for those who say, well, why didn't God make us that way in the first place? The answer is He did. And we ruined it by sinning and now we're being redeemed. And for those who say, well, what's, gonna, what's to stop us from messing it up all over again? I don't have any reason to believe that's going to happen because we'll be redeemed. The way I like to think about it, and again, again, just my opinion, but the way I like to think about it is, have you ever, have you ever made the mistake of looking into a kitchen of the restaurant you're eating in and you see stuff going on in there and you realize, I don't want to eat here anymore. We won't want to sin anymore because we'll, we will have looked into sin's kitchen, so to speak. We will have lived through a lifetime on earth and seen the, the terrible fruit of sin, and it will no longer be appealing to us. We'll be in the presence of God, and we will see the damage that sin has caused, and it won't even, it won't even tempt us anymore. When is this all going to happen? And what if, what if when Christ returns... 
and I rise again, what if I'm just a, a rotted corpse? Or what if, I'm, what if I've been burned in a fire or cremated? Or what if some animal ate me? I mean, what's, what happens then? Well, look at verse 51. Verse 51 says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we shall be changed. That term, in, the, in a moment in the twinkling of an eye, is one of the most encouraging things in the Bible, I think. Because what it means is there's not going to be any in-between time. So we die, we go to be with Christ, our bodies are in the ground. Whatever happens to our bodies at that point doesn't matter one bit. Because when Christ returns at the last trumpet, our bodies are changed that quickly. We're raised to new life. And that's an exciting thing to think about. He says in verse 53, For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And I've told you this story before, but I, I, I need to tell it again. It's just a perfect time for it. When I was pastor of the little church in Stockdale, Texas, Stockdale is about 30 minutes south of Seguin. When you go on I-10 to San Antonio, you go through Seguin, turn left, and you hit Stockdale. It's a one-stop light town. Sweet, sweet people. And a small enough town that if you're a pastor of any of the churches there, you're a pastor to the whole town, which was enjoyable to me. Um, but every year at Easter, we had an Easter sunrise service with all the churches in town. All the churches would gather except one because they thought they were the only ones going to heaven. And uh, I can't wait to see them if they get there and, and say, hey, remember me. But uh, I'll let you guess which church it was. But uh, So all the other churches would gather for this sunrise service and, and they would draw straws and, and a different preacher would preach the sermon and then they'd all gather at the Methodist church for breakfast afterwards. But the place where we gathered for the sunrise service was the town cemetery. And I remember the first year I heard that and I thought, boy, that's weird. That is a, that's the weirdest thing I've ever heard. But then I went to it and I realized, especially by the time I'd been there my third year, how special that was. Because by that time, I'd actually buried some people in that cemetery. And so I, some of the names on those tombstones were names I remembered and recognized. And when I looked at those names, I'd think, yeah, I'm going to see Bird again. Yeah, I'm going to see Joyce again. And that was exciting to me. To me, that was the perfect place to have an Easter sunrise service because in a way, we were right there on death's doorstep, in death's headquarters, you might say. And we were saying, we're not afraid of you. We're going to see these people again. You've got nothing on us because God, through Jesus Christ, has already defeated you. We were shaking our fist at death. So come on, do your worst. You kill us and it's just a promotion and we will win in the end. And I still love the, that thought now, the idea that we can walk through a cemetery and yes, we're sad, we're sorrowful at the people we've lost. We, we hate the fact that we don't get to be with them daily now but we'll see him again. And that gives us joy even in the midst of our sorrow. We can, like Paul, say, O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, these are such good, good things that we're reading. And even if we can't completely wrap our minds around some of them, Lord, we know enough. We understand enough to know it's good. It is so much better than any version of hope this world offers us, to know, Lord God, that our bodies will be resurrected, that we will have a chance to live in a world without sin, that we'll have a chance to see you face to face, and Lord, to be reunited with those who've gone before us. All of these things we need to remember daily. We need to remember often so that we don't get discouraged. So help us to walk in this hope and to share it with others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, we pray. Amen.